Joining us today from London is Marta Foresti, Director at the Overseas Development Institute, a global think tank for peace and sustainability. Marta, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Now, the, the migration narrative in the Mediterranean has been strongly polarized for years now. Uh, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has intensified this uh, polarization? And if so, how? So as you say, the, the narrative around migration in the Mediterranean region, and in particular between Africa and Europe, uh, has been polarized and politically difficult to engage with for uh, a number of years. Um, and yet there are some important lessons that uh, we learned even before uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. And I think it would be key to learn from them to make sure that we adapt to this new reality of life with um, the uh, with COVID uh, as most countries in the region um, work uh, towards a, a recovery. What we knew about migration narratives and particularly about public attitudes uh, towards migration in, in the countries, in the regions, um, in certainly in Europe, but also increasingly uh, in Africa and the Middle East, um, is that contrary to what most people believe, the public attitudes towards migration is not that polarized, meaning that the attitudes that people have are not as negative as one might assume given the political debate uh, in uh, a lot of the countries uh, in the region. And so while, uh, particularly during political campaigns, people become very interested in migration, and migration certainly has a strong political salience uh, in a number of countries. And there is no doubt that the, pub you know, the public in a number of countries are very worried about uncontrolled migration, illegal migration, you know, being invaded by, uh, by migrants, um, this is um, in no way, you know, is, is not particularly uh, entrenched, meaning that people don't have inherent negative views about migrants, about migrants, about the other, and actually have a real appetite to try to see this problem resolved um, and addressed, including with fairness and a greater degree of humanity. Um, a good case in point is a country like the UK, which is obviously not in the Mediterranean region, but until recently very much linked to Europe where during the campaign for the, uh, for the, Brexit, for the, for the Brexit referendum, um, the views uh, obviously, you know, a lot of it revolved around immigration issues. And yet uh, polls since the referendum showed very clearly that um, the views of the British public towards migration has become much more positive. And interestingly, with a particular trend ever since the so-called Windrush scandal that so uh, people being mistreated um, uh, because of unfair immigration policies, um, and then public attitudes becoming much more um, open to uh, the need to address migration in fairer ways. So this is a bit of a conundrum. So we know that it's a topic where people are, you know, fundamentally open-minded. In the vast majority, in, you know, in almost all countries in Europe, the vast majority of people are undecided. You know, roughly 50% of the population does not hold particularly strong negative or positive views about migration. They want to be reassured about how it's going to be handled and they have worries. Sometimes they're called the so-called anxious middle. So people that do not, do not have strong views that want mostly to be reassured and better informed. And yet at every turn in, you know, in political campaigns, we've seen nationalist politicians and parties really making immigration the centerpiece of political campaigns and in most cases being very successful at it. So this requires some thinking and some innovative ways to try to um, live with this, with this uh, knowledge in the way we think of the narrative that we use. Exactly. And as this requires some extra thinking, let me get a bit deeper into this. So if we look at the official data from Frontex, we can see how irregular migration has significantly decreased, especially since uh, 2015. And as you said earlier, uh, research uh, suggests that public attitudes on migration are not becoming more negative. Instead, they have been stable for at least a decade. Nonetheless, the public debate on migration, especially within the Mediterranean, seems to focus mainly on the negative side of the overall phenomenon. Now, you explain the problem, like 
how can you explain the, this paradox and what are the main findings of uh, ODI on this? So I think actually this paradox has become very apparent uh, during the, you know, in the early stages during the um, outbreak of the, uh, of, of the COVID pandemic and I think is now evolving rapidly as most countries um, adapt to a period of difficult uh, recovery. So what we're seeing um, in, in these last few weeks is two things that once again appear contradictory or you know there are somewhat you know point to different directions on the one hand um, we've seen a number of countries uh, getting even more preoccupied about controlling borders i think we can all anticipate that in the near future there will be less opportunity for people to meet and more anxieties about keeping countries safe and border uh, and border secure at the same time, in a number of countries, um, we have, you know, people seem to have woken up to the reality that migrant workers are indeed key and essential workers uh, in our economies and societies, both in a situation where, you know, in the, in the health sectors during, during an emergency, but also increasingly recognized, particularly in, our, in the agricultural sector, in the care economy, um, the delivery drivers, all the people that are keeping our countries and our societies um, afloat and safe, uh, both during the emergency and, and in the recovery. So to me, that points to one particular um, and important uh, finding, and is that if you ask people what, how they feel about a migrant, a person that is other, you know, different um, from themselves and somebody has different characteristics and does not have the same origin, is not born in the same place. Um, uh, people have strong, you know, tend to have views about what kind of migrants they, uh, they like and they're prepared to accept. But if you ask people um, whether they want their communities to remain safe and services to be delivered and people to be healthy, uh, people are very much in favor uh, to make that happen and to have reform that are conducive to that to that end. And so all of a sudden, the fact that migrant workers can be pretty key to achieve these objectives, I think is an opportunity to help people look at the phenomena from a completely different viewpoint. So not necessarily, and this is my challenge, uh, framing migration in positive ways or looking at the success stories of migrants, but rather breaking down the barrier between the migrants and us and talk much more openly about our collective future uh, as a key to get, you know, to, um, you know, to get out of the pandemic and to overcome the challenges of, of COVID where countries will need to think at you know, new and adapted ways of recoveries where all of us can benefit and all of us need to play a part. Okay, so you talked about uh, uh Migrant key workers, also in a recent blog that you authored, uh, an ode to key workers, if, I, if I'm not wrong. And also you talk about breaking barriers. Now, as you mentioned, like during the pandemic, the role of these so-called uh, key migrant workers, sorry, sorry, migrant key workers, has been very relevant, has been very discussed in both international and national media. So you mentioned the, the, the impact of positive stories, but you suggested uh, something more in detail. Um, what about, what is the importance of raising awareness of sometimes these hidden aspects of migration, like the fact that uh, uh, many economies, especially in Europe, depend on these very specific profiles that are fundamental for the functioning of our society. Can this actually help shift the attention from the negative to the positive side of migration? What, what is uh, your recommendation and your findings on this? So I think this can help us enormously. In fact, I've written, you know, since that original blog where I spotted this as, a, uh, as something that in fact was about to happen in so, in, in so many countries and what I've been thinking since, um, given how much uh, uh, this topic has, uh, you know, resonates now uh, in different parts of the world and how many um, uh, innovations, how many reforms, how many new initiatives that we are actually very actively tracking um, at ODI um, are, you know, week by week uh, are developing, all aiming to um, find practical ways to recognize the value and the contribution of migrant workers uh, as essential key workers in the COVID response. 
But I think that the real opportunity and the, the, the key insights for this experience is that the reason why this has, you know, this resonates with the public in so many contexts is because key workers are all of us. So the migrant workers are part of now, you know, an awareness about the value and the contribution of a broader set of people who are members of our community that are the heroes, the people that in this country, in the UK, we clap for every Thursday night, um, the people who are keeping us alive. And they are, you know, the, the migrant members, the, the migrant workers are part of this community. So they're now, you know, they're, they are, they are us, they're, they, we are in this endeavor uh, together. And I think the key challenge is to maintain this sense of collective endeavor for the recovery and for the future. So these are workers that were not just essential in a crisis, in a moment of emergencies, when docs were flown in from different parts of the world, the delivery drivers, the care workers, in fact, the, agric the agricultural workers, which have been in the spotlight in Italy in the last few days, uh, are essential for our economies and societies um, going forward. So yes, so I think that's the, that's the insights and the, and the opportunity, is to shift the narrative away from us and them and to shift the narrative towards us and the collective destiny and the collective purpose of this next phase. So I would suggest that it's less an issue or less a matter of spotting, you know, putting a spotlight on the positive stories and once again trying to suggest, you know, as a reaction to the negative views that there is a more, you know, the other side of the coin is the positive story that shows that migrants are good. The challenge is to now shift the conversation towards migrants are all of us. Uh, and there's, you know, breaking down this barrier of diversity where the definition and the labor of migrant is one that immediately indicates that it's somebody born elsewhere with a different culture, typically with a different skin color, with a different set of traditions, whereas now they're us. In this very regards, I'd like to ask you a specific question that uh, comes out from a research that was actually done in the UK about the so-called Salah effect. I'm referring to uh, the notorious uh, Liverpool FC yeah. footballer Mohamed Salah, one of the best footballers in the world today of Egyptian origin, uh, a devoted uh, Muslim, somebody very discreet, uh, who has had uh, a tremendous impact uh, in society. And in fact, researchers basically have analyzed how uh, since Salah joined uh, Liverpool and pretty much started helping the team uh, winning uh, even the Champions League most recently, there has been a corresponding decrease in hate crime and hate speech on social networks exactly from people um, that usually are Liverpool supporters. So they actually went really in detail uh, at looking uh, into the areas where the most Liverpool FC supporters were and managed to prove that the performance of a champion of migration, as we can call him uh, in this case, has actually had a societal impact. Now, in, in citing this example, the, apart from the ordinary heroes that you mentioned in uh, uh, in, in shifting this debate from migration crisis to migration capital, what could be the role of celebrities and testimonials in breaking these barriers? So the, the potential for uh, celebrities, for you know, successful people, of which, as we all know, there are many in the migrant communities around the world, because consistently, you know, if you look at the most successful entrepreneurs, at the most, you know, the you know, in, in no, no matter in which field of sports, business, uh, music you look at, you can always find um, migrants who are examples of, uh, of, of success stories. And we know, you know, research also tells us that migrants, people who move from their home and learn, adapt to life in different contexts and countries tend to be very resilient individuals that have you know, are driven, are strong, motivated, as, as well as also being typically young and healthy, which means also that, as we know, they tend not to be big, big burdens on societies. So there is definitely scope to do uh, to do more, particularly in the public, um, you know, in the public space. With I think, 
not just uh, celebrities, but generally leaders in different fields taking more of a stand and actually speaking out and contributing uh, both, you know, in, you know, as migrants themselves in the, in, 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 the, in the debate, but also, for example, business leaders that could be much more vocal about the fact that they, you know, their, their businesses thrive because um, of the contribution of workers uh, of different, you know, different origins and different sectors. Um, it's been fascinating to see, for example, the, the effect that having a politician in Italy becoming emotional about a reform that she's been driven because she herself, you know, not necessarily as a migrant in that case, but as, you know, a worker in, in, in uh, unfair conditions has experienced. And so being able to bring uh, the personal experience uh, to the, you know, to the, to the fore is definitely something that all research shows that could be you know, more can be done, you know, more can be done. My, again, my challenge for, for us, so for the community of people that uh, considers migration is to learn to do that, not necessarily just emphasizing the, you know, the identity of the people, of the people as migrants, but the identity of people as, as, as human beings that have, or are celebrities or innovators that bring, you know, bring an interesting perspective or a personal stories to the fore. I mean, it, it, Liverpool is interesting because of Mo Salah, but also because of the, um, of the, of course, of the manager. Uh, now the name is escaping me. The the German, um, ah, you know what I mean. The German. Uh, <laughs> you can look Mr. Klopp. Mr. Mr. Klopp. And so I think Liverpool. I think that so the whole narrative about the team, including interesting enough, in the early days, on the COVID response. I mean, when Klopp was asked in the, you know, at the press conference. You know what he thought about you know sh you know uh, stopping the Premier League. It is it, it gave a very straight response about how important it was to keep everybody safe and how unimportant football was. And so, which in, in the in the UK having sort of a German you know both the European as well as the you know the the the, the Egyptian migrant more or less in the same space, uh, providing an alternative, different positive narrative that in many ways has nothing to do with the fact that they are from Germany and from Egypt, right? It's about their, you know, their warmth as human being, their intelligence, their capacity, you know, their empathy, their capacity to engage with the public. So yes, there is scope to do more engagement with the public with migrants who represent, you know, the success or, you know, having achieved something with their lives. But once again, I think that's not enough or perhaps not even the point is, is actually finding a language and a point of connection on things that matter to people, you know, that are not necessarily relating to the reality of migration. And so the labels of, of campaigns that emphasize, you know, I'm a migrant or the migrant hero, I do think are part of what we need to reconsider because they do, I think, as you suggest in one of your questions also, you know, have the potential of fighting back a little bit when you are trying to counteract a negative narrative with a positive one, but fundamentally, you know, using the same rules of engagement rather than leaving that debate about whether the, a migrant can be good or bad or migration is a good or bad thing behind and moving on to what matters to people, which is football, which is fairness, which is keeping safe rather than going to crowded stadiums. And in the context of the COVID recovery, um, having resilient societies and economies that can see us through this very uncertain times and the contribution and the skills that everybody can bring uh, to this endeavor and kind of almost like taking away the attention and the focus to the place where people are born and to bring in much more to what they're able to do, what they're able to contribute, taxes, skills, you know, human sort of human values. Uh, we discussed uh, a lot about communication. You, just talk, uh, you discussed about uh, a distorted narrative, a uh, polarized debate. Uh, but uh, if I was a policymaker, why should I care about this? Why should I care about public attitudes? Why should I care about communication? Why should I care about uh, uh, public perceptions? Thus, communication, thus, the migration narrative actually has an impact on policy making when it comes to migration policy? So this is a bit of a chicken and egg question. So you will have um, policymakers, but especially politicians time and time again, especially those that need to stand for election sometime soon, 
um, citing public attitudes to migration as a reason for uh, you know being you know either being uh, either being strict and hostile towards migrants or at best to ignore the reality of migration altogether. Uh, the, going back to what we were discussing earlier about the research on public attitudes or political salience of migration, what we know is that public attitudes towards migration tend to be particularly negative around political campaigning and political messages that can fuel anxieties and worries around uh, particularly the mismanagement of, of migration, rather than being, as we said earlier, entrenched and negative on migration per se. Uh, so, um, uh, so I think there is, you know, policymakers and politicians, I think, can and should afford a little bit more, um, you know, flexibility and a bit more of an open mind about these questions, including because the public actually want to be reassured about how this um, is going to be handled. Now, again, I think the, 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 the news of the last couple of days from Italy and the, the, the reform that is one element of a broader reform package around the recovery from COVID that you know, is, is, includes an element of regularization of all irregular migrants uh, in particular sectors is, is actually an interesting one in that respect, because there you have a politician who is fundamentally um, uh, who is in charge of agricultural policy rather than home affairs or border control, who has you know, the very specific challenge of sustaining a sector that is in crisis and that is key for the recovery of the country in COVID, where in that particular context, the reality of irregular uh, workers, both uh, migrants, but also natives, Italians, that are uh, you know, is, is a reality of the agricultural sector, needs to be addressed and resolved. And so there you have the opportunity of bringing about a significant reforms in terms of regularization of migrants alongside the regularization of other workers, including Italian workers, in a particular sector where there are you know, opportunities and needs uh, in the economy and societies, and the same applies to domestic work and care workers. So again, what would be the opportunity for, or, or the incentive for somebody standing for, you know, for running a country um, of, you know, to be, uh, you know, political leaders in the next few years on immigration, I don't expect them to be very different. And if anything, I think we will see a backlash uh, in terms of uh, political um, sort of appetite to be, you know, more um, flexible when it comes particularly to border controls, given the anxiety that the movement of people is bringing to the management of COVID. On the other hand, I would like to see, and I think there should be uh, spaces for politicians in different sectors, uh, healthcare, uh, agriculture, climate change, anybody who's in charge of youth, um, to really be uh, much more pragmatic and open-minded uh, open about the fact that labour rules and labour policies might need reform in ways that will include the opportunity to integrate better migrant workers. So again, it's a bit of a shift from thinking about how do we find opportunities to amend immigration policy and actually begin to think about the opportunities that might exist in sectoral policies where we, are, we have learned through the COVID experience, migrant workers are absolutely key. And from that perspective, the, so the, the regularization in Italy and, and, and in other countries are interesting experiments, um, however imperfect, but I think go at least in the right direction in terms of creating a different set of incentives for policymakers to engage with this debate from a different standpoint, which is one that relates to sectoral policies and labor regulations. It's also worth uh, remembering that there are uh, different policymakers and politicians that have different priorities. And it, it strikes me uh, increasingly how mayors and more generally uh, local uh, politicians that you know, lead uh, at the local level uh, have a greater appetite than ever to engage uh, in these debates, primarily, particularly mayors of large cities, because they live the reality of human mobility inside and between uh, their cities on a day to day, and because they uh, need to address the reality uh, of migration in, in, as part of urban policies uh, uh, as a matter of, uh, of practice. And so increasingly, we have seen mayors around the world uh, taking steps and, ex and exercising leadership in this space, including at the international level. I'm thinking about 
the way they're working together on, on climate, but also migration, like the mayor's migration councils. We are working with a set of mayors in, in Europe and Africa, um, so very much around the Mediterranean region, uh, setting up a dialogue uh, on human mobility. And so there may be opportunities, I think, in the near future to engage more and more directly with local politicians and policymakers on this matter in ways that I think has uh, less, uh, 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 less constraints than some of the national uh, politicians might have in engaging in this uh, political debate. So you're talking about a spillover effect, meaning that uh, policies that seem uh, to be strictly related to migration and integration actually have a spillover effect in different other policy areas of a country or a region yeah. or even a continent like in the case of the European Union. Uh, in relation to this, uh, as we explained, uh, migration is a multifaceted phenomenon that touches upon uh, a variety of, of, of policies and uh, but unfortunately, what we've seen in communication trends over the past decade at least, and I'm happy to ask you since ODI also has a very strong network of communicators worldwide, uh, what we've seen is that communication effectiveness, uh, at, at least in terms of visibility, is more focused on speed over accuracy. Now, how do you, within your experience and the experience of ODI, communicate effectively and maintain visibility and explain at the same time a phenomenon that requires deep understanding that is not a black and white phenomenon. You cannot pick sides on migration being good or being bad. It needs a deep, it needs extensive knowledge, deep understanding, debate, explanation in an environment where speed overtakes accuracy for, for this uh, rat race of visibility. How does ODI work in making sure that all information are communicated uh, appropriately and to the right audience? I mean, this is a, obviously is a, is, a, is, is a big dilemma and it's something that we are, you know, we learn by doing and we try to adapt as we go along. And I will be the first one to say that in our communications work on migration, I have learned along the way. Uh, I mean, I set off to, you know, we as an, as an institution, we began to work uh, more intensely on migration since 2015. And certainly to begin with, I do think that we have, uh, you know, uh, perhaps reacted because of that pressure to, you know, for speed in trying to, you know, always in a, better, in a bit of a reactive mode, to always trying to counterbalance that negative narrative with a positive one and insisting on finding rapidly, you know, very touching and positive stories to try to counterbalance the, the negative narrative. So that, but that's, I think that's a mistake that we need to learn from. I think because, as you said, we've been under pressure for speed, we have ended up uh, sort of playing by the same rules as effectively, you know, the, you know, the, the old right or, you know, the, the highly nationalist debates that have sort of really uh, manipulated uh, the highly emotional um, uh, sentiment that people can have about otherness and unknown and and therefore painting the migrant as a representation of uh, you know the anxieties that people legitimately have in terms of their own future their own work and their own insecurity uh, so I think because of that speed issue we ended up uh, just uh, sort of uh, being in a responsive mode rather than really thinking through an effective way of framing the debate differently you know, we need to, I think this time around, speed might be on our side, right? In terms of we have seen very rapidly the context changing in the last few weeks. And we've seen there is a moment of opportunity. Of course, it's not going to last long. So we do need to be a little bit, you know, quick on our feet. Not necessarily to just find the right slogan the way Boris does here, because that clearly doesn't work. Uh, we need to find a different framing for the debate. And we need to, I, as I said earlier, I think it's a, it's a time to move on from the framing on positive and negative and the good and the bad and really moving towards a framing of you know communities and all of us and our collective um, and our collective future um, on accuracy i think that in an attempt to be accurate we as in the you know the policy analyst community um, i've had a very interesting and difficult um, experience with this field because for once 
we were handling a phenomena where most economists in the world will actually agree. Uh, there is this overwhelming sort of economic evidence that migration is ultimately a good thing for societies and, the con and, 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 the, and economies. You can have debates about how much of a good thing it is. In some cases, might be a bit of, you know, might have mutual effect, but fundamentally you have, you can find any number of economists tomorrow that will come and do an interview like this and tell you that facts at hand, migration is a terribly good thing for economies all over the world. And so we have used that, um, that evidence at times to react or to counterbalance some of the negative uh, narratives, which was uh, much more grounded in more emotional framing around people's own values and beliefs and concerns and worries about, and, and uncertainties about their future. And that was a mistake. I think that we made a mistake of uh, using, um, using evidence, particularly of, of an economic nature, to respond to arguments that fundamentally were framed as um, you know, building on um, um, emotions and concerns. It doesn't mean that we should leave behind accuracy and evidence. To the contrary, we should definitely treasure it. And, you know, and, you know, be precisely because we have so much evidence in our pockets, in our toolkit, toolbox that we can uh, share and work with, but we've got to find ways to communicate that evidence in different ways and tailor it to the diff to different uh, to different audiences, as I say. And this is where, if you ask about the experience of ODI, uh, this is where we have, you know, the experience of the last few weeks and months has been moving from a blog that clearly touched, you know, in an early stage, um, uh, engaged in a, at the time, fairly nascent and new debate that was emerging. So being in a way at the right, in the right place at the right time, and then beginning quite fast to collect the evidence, but then turn the evidence into, uh, you know, a, a form, you know, a, 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 yeah, a form, or, uh, yeah, format that can be shared and can be used and can be you know evolved over time and this is where the the data visualization that we are working on for the the stories of migrant workers come in and so continuously bring all these elements together and so to really try to have you know to spot the right moment to engage in a conversation with the right tone and then make sure that so the evidence is not just collected and that you can repeat it back but also that you can uh, curate it and use it uh, in ways that can then engage um, engage different audiences. So, you know, I'm afraid it's not a, I think we went through a phase of realizing what we've done wrong with the narrative and the evidence, which has been very much to, you know, to, in a, you know, to actually just sort of to use our, you know, the strength of our, economic evidence to try to persuade people of things that required, you know, a number of other arguments to be, uh, to be won, to one where we are learning to be not just nuanced, but also to be eclectic and adaptive in the way we reach out to different audiences and using deliberately uh, different sets of, uh, of tools from more traditional research um, evidence to the uh, communication um, and particularly through the visual communication work that we have tried to do um, in in the last couple of years so so it's a bit of a work in progress but I would return again to this shift in the narrative uh, and to really and this is where it gets quite challenging for all of us and I don't know the answer of it to it but my impression is that we've got to talk less about migration so we, we've got to take away the emphasis to the reality or to the, to, to the characteristics of individuals as migrants, to the phenomenon of the fact that people move from one place to the other, which is something that has been you know, inevitable and now is going to become even more challenging, and really put the emphasis on you know, the real life problems we all share, maintaining levels of services in the health sector, you know, post-Brexit um, in the UK and post-COVID, for example, or, you know, um, making sure that the, you know, the agricultural sector in Italy can survive the shock uh, of COVID and that, you know, fruits uh, and vegetables are going to be picked uh, next season and try to use those as entry point for the conversations rather than, let me try to explain to you why 
migrants are very good or why migration is a very good thing? As uh, some of our studies published uh, together with the Observatory on Public Attitudes to Migration from the European University Institute, yeah. we would summarize that into reduce salience. Exactly. Now, um, to conclude, uh, Marta, you have over 20 years experience in the field of migration. Uh, what would be your main recommendations for uh, communication experts and practitioners covering migration in the Mediterranean for the years to come? So I've got two recommendations, uh, and they are mostly uh, grounded in the, in the fact that I, you know, I do have more than 20 years of experience, but not actually on migration policies. I mean, I worked most of my career out on uh, sort of local economic development policies and then international uh, and sort of global development issues. And in fact, I came to migration in the last uh, five or six years or um, um, as an area of, of interest. And so uh, I always observed migration a little bit as an outsider, as somebody who's come to this, uh, uh, you know, with a, a professional and personal experience in uh, grounded in different sectors. And so my two recommendations based on that uh, are the first, the one I mentioned a number of times, is to reframe the debate around us and not them. And to make that, you know, to bring that to the heart of the language we use. Uh, it is incredible how much the word migrant can be a shorthand for so many different things. When we're talking about fundamentally people who are you know, born in a country different from the one where they happen to live at this particular time. Uh, and so really to almost, to, to take away the emphasis from the definition of migrants for that matter and refugees and all the debates you know, around the, the connection or the difference between the two and much more put the spotlight back on us or me and you on us together uh, and use the, you know, the, the fact that there is so much appetite now to reset the conversation, uh, to rethink everything in the world in light of COVID. It, it couldn't be a more opportune time to reset the narrative uh, on migration away from them and back onto us together. And the second one is less about communication, is a lot more specific to those who work on, on, on policy development and advising policymakers and, de and designing policies to stop treating immigration policy in isolation from uh, the problems that immigration relates to. So to really think about the policies, the sectors uh, that require innovation, that require investment, that require uh, workers and rethinking the, you know, the, the regulations around, uh, around work. Uh, and to consider how, you know, how the reality of human mobility can interact and become an asset to deliver policy objectives in health, in education, in social protection, where we'll need to rethink the whole world of you know, safety net um, and social welfare post-COVID or with COVID. Uh, and so there is a real opportunity again, as so many policy conversations are starting and we need, are in desperate need for innovative thinking to bring in the reality of the fact that part of your solution can be found you know in the pool of workers uh, uh, that happen to be foreign born in a country in a pool you know some of you know in the pool of doctors for example that were present in the United States and that were not allowed to work until very you know very you know in a very rapid way in the last few weeks, they've seen uh, state after state removing um, uh, regulations to allow people to work and be contribute to the response uh, to COVID, uh, or the fact that you may not have enough young people to fulfill uh, new roles, for example, um, in agriculture uh, in, in particular countries, um, that you may not eno have enough nurses to sustain the National Health Service in the UK once all the European nurses will be gone. And so to really, to really very pragmatically, to some extent even opportunistically, spot um, where there are sectoral openings, sectoral resets in the policy conversation, where we can bring migration into the picture as a strategy to achieve change rather than continuously advocating for reform in immigration policies per se, which I frankly see in the next few months is even more challenging than ever before. I think it's going to be terribly difficult in the next few years to argue in favor of more flexible border policies and management.
in light of all the additional challenges that COVID has brought to human mobility. Marta Foresti, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Mark, it's been a pleasure. Adesso io penso che abbiamo finito.